Good afternoon. My name is Nicoletta Pieredo. I'm the inaugural director of the Georgetown Humanities Initiative. And together with my colleagues and co-organizers, Lourdes Ortega, Anna Defina, and Negar Siari, I wish to welcome all of you to Ukrainian Literature in Times of War, a conversation with Oksana Zabushko. This is the third event of our Global Humanities Seminar Series, Understanding and Including Forced Migrants and Refugees, Responses from the Humanities. We wish to thank the Office of the Vice President for Global Engagement for the grant that has made this project possible, the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures for partnering with us, and Lindellis and the, the College Zoom team for their technical support. Let me add that this webinar is being recorded. When we started planning this uh, seminar series back in November 2021, we would never have imagined that uh, the mm -hmm. world scenario would change so dramatically in less than three months, and that the already too many geographical and cultural spaces lacerated by violence and forced displacement that we were striving to represent with our project would also include a war-torn Ukraine. We felt uh, the urgency to engage with this absurd tragedy in the heart of Europe, and we knew that uh, no more forceful literary voice could speak to us and with us about it than Oksana Zabushko. An award-winning novelist, a poet, and essayist, Dr. Zabushko is recognized as Ukraine's leading public intellectual. She made her poetry debut at the age of 12, However, as her parents had been blacklisted during the Soviet purges of the 1970s, she could not publish until the Perestroika. Since then, she has authored an impressive array of works that address the complexity of Ukrainian national identity by blending past and present history, politics, society, gender and family relationships, and the body, writing, as she says, in an endangered language. Among the English translations of her work, I wish to mention her first novel, Fieldwork in Ukrainian Sex, considered one of the pivotal texts in post-Soviet Ukrainian literature. Controversial and pioneering, it denounces man-woman relationships that impose traditional patriarchal roles and subject women to social and sexual oppression as the equivalent of totalitarianism. Her monumental novel, The Museum of Abandoned Secrets, uh, 2009, addresses Ukraine's opposition to 20th century Soviet regime, debunking the myth of the friendships of nations that endured in Putin's Russia. It was awarded the Angelus Central European Literary Prize in 2013 as the best novel of Eastern and Central Europe. Her nonfiction books include the collection of poems and essays, A Kingdom of Fallen Statues, and Notre Dame d'Ukraine, 2007, a historical and intellectual journey through ages, cultures, and denominations in search of a lost Ukraine and centered around the fin de siècle Ukrainian writer Lesia Ukrainka. Among her numerous national and international recognitions are the Antonovich International Foundation Prize in 2008, the Ukrainian National Award of the Order of Princess Olga in 2009, and the Shevchenko National Prize of Ukraine in 2019. Her collection of stories, Your Ad Could Go Here, uh, 2017, was listed by the New York Times among the 100 best books of 2020 from around the world. Countries do not disappear, we read in one of these stories, no matter how many times the maps are redrawn, just as a person doesn't vanish just because his picture is destroyed. With her works, Oksana Zabushko puts her country back on the map over and over again with its traumas, its resilience, and its hopes despite the recurring redrawing and renaming to which its spaces have been and are being violently subjected. The spaces of a country that, as she claims, is post, three times over, post-communist, post-totalitarian, and post-colonial. 
the warmth with which Dr. Zabushko accepted our invitation, despite the dire situation in her country and the difficulty of planning, has been really touching for all of us. We are deeply grateful to her, and it's an incredible privilege to have her with us today. Dr. Zabushko will share her reflections on her work, her country, and what it means to write in times of war. The event will then continue with conversations and Q&As with my co-organizers and the audience. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to give the floor to Dr. Zabushka. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for this wonderful presentation. It's really a privilege to be here and to be a part of this project. I can't be more appreciative about the whole idea of this project to make uh, your students aware uh, to the uh, cultures uh, previously under translated, under estimated um, those that are well under the attack and here is the uh, key point i would say that troubles me most in the entire situation uh, since uh, the russian invasion uh, on the morning of february 24 which had finally awakened uh, the collective west so to speak. It is like the same story repeating itself many times through ages and decades. Um, that, um, yes, uh, first, there should be a war, there should be, uh, well, a coup or, uh, well, some atrocities. Uh, some, I don't know, totalitarian regime, whatever else, to get the attention uh, to the rest of the world that this territory actually can be interesting also uh, in the cultural aspect. That it includes that it is it has been inhabited through all this time when we were not looking. It has been inhabited with generations after generations of people who were busy uh, creating culture, painting, uh, writing, uh, singing, uh, playing musical instruments, creating this unique and irreproducible world of theirs that we are used to associate with the word culture. And um, somehow, every time, it is only after some violence comes up to the stage of history that culture makes it to the stage. Uh, well, I, uh, as someone who has been, uh, as someone who was born uh, and grew up in the Soviet Union and who was studying Marx in uh, my students' year for longer than I wanted, um, I hate. Uh, sounding more Marxist uh, than I actually am, but I really can't but recall this horrible, actually, uh, if you think about it in humanist terms, this horrible saying by him, the horrible formula about violence being the midwives of history. Uh, and yes, uh, now uh, being, um, well, now I would say Ukrainian writers, myself included, uh, we are the beneficiaries, so to speak, of the victories of the Ukrainian army. It is all about uh, this grand myth 
of the inv great invincible Russia boasting the alleged second army in the world, this myth of David and Goliath suddenly being galvanized, revitalized uh, in the view of the surprised uh, Western civilization that uh, really gave us the microphone and made us heard, um, which, um, which I cannot take though otherwise, well, I know, I know it is one of these, uh, you know, unwritten laws of history and um, um, more than once in this uh, nine months have we been recalling the, uh, this famous, another famous saying from the 19th century, the age of rising European nationalisms, when all these discussions about the differences between languages and dialects uh, were very popular and uh, the author uh, still uh, well, remains questionable, but the formula is great that the uh, there was some you know second rate politician in the time of uh, the Franco Prussian War who uh, coined this definition that lang the difference is between the difference between language and dialect is that language is the dialect dialect with an army and the navy. Uh, so now uh, that um, after you know all the experts who uh, uh, on the morning of February 24 have been waiting uh, when uh, Ukraine collapses in 72 hours, uh, we had to uh, review uh, you know the uh, stereotypes and myths uh, on which they have been living through their previous career. Uh, well, then it, when it appeared, uh, as I think, uh, you know, some military expert in the US uh, said uh, that uh, Russia is not the second army in the world, but only the second army in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, the, so it is Ukrainian army um, uh, that uh, I would say um, I have to uh, admit, um, you know, with, uh, with a certain touch of bitterness that yes, it is Ukrainian army and not Oksana Zabushko, who has been trying to warn uh, the Western uh, intellectuals and decision makers uh, for, um, for at least, I don't know, well, since 2014, definitely, but even before 2014, because the Museum of Abandoned Secrets uh, well, so kindly, uh, so kindly mentioned in uh, this beautiful introduction you've all heard. Um, well, it's already the novel, um, the novel which appeared uh, in 2010, and the novel uh, which I would call now, in retrospect, looking looking 12 years back. Um, a novel about how war is um, coming into life. Uh, so I've, I have been interested in the subject uh, for quite a while. And uh, now looking uh, at my work uh, of this thing in the past, of the past two decades, uh, well, uh, I, uh, with a certain uneasiness, see that, yes, I can call myself a writer dealing with war in many different aspects, if only because I have always been interested in how big history shows itself 
at the everyday level, how it shows itself uh, in small things, um, in uh, the life of uh, people who may be unaware of uh, this great history and this uh, this entire narrative of this big historical things affecting their lives but their lives are affected by it without their awareness history big history transpiring showing itself up uh, in our lives uh, beyond our awareness, well, that's something that has always been the subject of my uh, writer's concern. And uh, and whenever asked uh, by, uh, especially for some reason, by American interviewers, like, how do you manage to combine personal and political in your writings? Uh, I feel stupefied uh, like every time I, had, I face this question and have to answer it, uh, because for me it is all the same. I don't understand what is political as, uh, as abstraction. Uh, well, of course, I do know that uh, well, there, is, there are scholarly studies, there is political theory, uh, that yes, you can summarize all these things in certain formulas, uh, well, and I gave you the example of Marx um, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, well, but uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I um, I rather I rather I rather side uh, with where uh, Camus, uh, who who once said, well, many years ago. If you want to be a philosopher, write a novel. And uh, being a philosopher by background, uh, I totally subscribe uh, to this definition. Yes, I do write uh, novels to find answers to all these uh, big uh, questions, uh, which in, in my understanding, um, can be approached only on the level of how they are, these big issues, and I mean, how they are uh, experienced and survived by real people, flesh and blood. And that's where we are now uh, in Ukraine, and that's uh, where we are with this war, with this, you know, big history uh, that uh, has we, that has always been here. War does not happen. It is not a thunderstorm, even if it might look like this for someone who was not looking that side for quite a while. Uh, every war, uh, of especially of that scale that we are having now in Europe, the biggest one since World War II, uh, every war um, has a long prehistory before it shaped itself to the condition we read about in the textbooks. And the way it shapes itself, the way this number of system errors in society get, gets amassed um, to, the, to some point of no return when it cannot be uh, repaired and it cannot be, I mean, this toothpaste cannot be squeezed back into the tube. Uh, so um, until then, there is, the literature is always there. 
we writers, the unheard Cassandras, are always there warning, uh, well, putting things down, depicting them, known, uh, well, giving our diagnosis, uh, nailing our fingers here and there. Mm, uh, only if you look back after the war has already happened and presented itself in all in its entire you know, invincibility and in its entire mighty physical presence which cannot be ignored anymore. Only then uh, those um, unheard Cassandras of the past are getting heard and the reaction is like, oh, how interesting. Oh, well, this writer and that writer, oh, we should, we should have this writer, we should uh, translate it, or oh, well, how we... And uh, you mentioned Lesia Ukrainka and uh, well, one of my role models. And I would say one of my uh, permanent, one of the permanent, traumas of my international career because, uh, because I've always felt extremely uncomfortable um, when having to explain, to, when having first to answer, to, to explain uh, my literary lineage, to explain uh, um, about my literary mothers, and most importantly, uh, well, to elucidate a little, to put um, to put some light upon the Ukrainian literary scene of the past century, um, to make the point, um, you know, especially as a woman writer, to make this point, which I think is extremely impossible, uh, extremely important, uh, that it is totally impossible to have a complete history of European women's writings without uh, uh, Lesia Ukrainka, who is absolutely first rank author. And uh, without her, I'm not saying, you know, 16 volumes, but at least selected works being included in all the curricula of European literature, of, uh, of, of mo mo modern European literature, European literature of the 20th century, uh, we are missing uh, in our optics, in our seeing of history of the 20th century, we are missing um, a lot of uh, issues a lot of plots uh, that were um, making um, a continuity, bringing the light upon the current war as well. Uh, and uh, for years, uh, I've been trying to convince uh, your many, many European theater directors, uh, translators, uh, producers to do Lesia Ukrainka. She authored uh, over 20 dramas, most of them in verse. Uh, well, of course, you know, uh, Belle Epoque, she died in 1913. So the first decade uh, of the 20th century, well, that's the time for dramas in verse. That's the time for uh, Herhard Hauptmann and Maurice Metterling uh, and others, uh, well, who were her favorite, by the way, and many of them uh, she translated. Um, so she, but the important thing is that she has done uh, uh, in, in this, 20 something dramas of her, she has done an extremely magnificent thing. Uh, she has rewritten um, uh, the basic blocks of the European cultural mythology from a woman's 
standpoint. Uh, like uh, starting with the history of the Trojan War, which in her version turned to be a history of Cassandra, a woman, an intellectual five act drama in which this woman, well, Cassandra, who is trying to warn her compatriots uh, about uh, the danger uh, looming in the air about the about the death was in danger about the death coming up that's the position the statue of of ukrainka herself of course that is of an intellectual a woman intellectual of a non-existent uh, then non-existent nation <clears throat> Ukrainian. That's why she took the pseudonym Ukrainka, which means Ukrainian. Her real, her, her, that's her pen name. Uh, well, her real name was Larissa Kosach. Uh, well, and um, nothing can be more topical nowadays than this five act drama written back in 1908 with. Cassandra opposing uh, her twin brother, Helen, uh, who appears to be a fake prophet. But this has been the first drama in European literature where what we now call media populism appears on the stage. Helen, unlike Cassandra, is loved by everyone is eulogized by the crowd he knows how to tell his audience exactly what the audience wants to hear and he has this brilliant career and it is a terrific depiction of the synthesis of uh, politics and show business 1908 mind you 1908 so it's really a prophetic drama and i've spent believe me i've spent um, you know uh, well like many many years trying uh, trying to convince the theater directors in europe uh, that it should be staged it should be staged yes because well, wake up, Troy. The war is coming up. The war is on the threshold. Um, and finally, finally, this October, uh, Cassandra by Lesya Ukrainka was uh, staged uh, by Theater Omnibus in London. And uh, yes, it is big big discovery and uh, i think there will be uh, well more of her place uh, on stage and uh, time like to time to discover something of uh, of ukraine of ukrainian classic of the highlights of ukrainian literature well but uh, that's again um, like the um, um like an extra proof uh, of what I've been trying to say, uh, what I've been trying to say before, um, uh, that uh, the tanks are still more convincing than the words. Even though it is the words which present the level at which every war starts. The words pave the road to the tanks but uh, but to have uh, Cassandra's heard yes you have first the uh, city of Troy to fall down under the siege and to have the gate of Troy <laughs> being being broken uh, well that's uh, kind of a um, um, uh, a lamentable introduction uh, that 
that I suggest. Uh, and yes, I, I have been, if only because I have been named Cassandra many times through these nine months, uh, but um, I did not. I was not taking it as a compliment. Uh, yes, I have been trying to well to do my warnings, so to speak, um, but only but in vain, mostly, uh, and only this March. Um, uh, I got a phone call from uh, the one of the European publishers, um, actually my agent to be precise, got a phone call from one of the uh, European publishers who asked me to write um, as soon as possible, of course, because uh, it's a commercial thing, yes, um, to write uh, something what they call uh, well pamphlet or brochure or book long essay, so to speak, uh, to explain, mind the formula, um, to the Western audience what we have missed in the contexts of this war in the past eight years. My question was why eight? So uh, I ended up, so this spring, uh, well, I, uh, I focused when, when the fate of the battle for K was yet undecided. Uh, I, uh, I, I locked myself, uh, you know, in the room and I've done uh, this uh, 100 something, uh, thousand characters as promised uh, and uh, this essay called originally my longest book tour turned to be the first my first book written at the public at the publisher's request not because I wanted to uh, not because I was trying to find uh, in it some answers to the questions that were bothering me, like uh, I usually do. Uh, well, but uh, well, I've done my part, uh, and uh, and I've done it on two levels. So it is like thirty years long story. The story uh, which started in 1989 with the alleged uh, end of the um, old war, which proved to be uh, not exactly the case, and I'm I'm uh, I'm following and uh, tracing why it was not the case and why this war was inevitable and why it's been in preparation for this entire thirty years, why the West was duped into believing um, that's the biggest question, how the West was duped into believing that the uh, Cold War is over, that the West has won the Cold War, and since now on, Russia will become a normal country, so to speak, a normal democratic country, uh, well, quite um, ready for the dialogue and for mutually beneficial cooperation. Uh, so where was this mistake? Very important system error. Uh, and then the second part uh, is the 300 years long story, which is the story of Ukrainian Russian relations starting back in the 17th century, not before. Uh, we, we were not acquainted before with the Russians, um, not before the 17th century. Uh, and this uh, 300 years uh, relationship and uh, Ukrainian part in creating, building um, Russian empire, or trying to modernize um, or rather to borrow a European face 
uh, to the Muscovy to create this Orthodox empire. That's another exciting story. So now this book, which appeared well already in, uh, in Swedish, in German, in, uh, in Norwegian, I came from also three years, three days ago, uh, where the book was presented and now is appearing in, uh, in, in, in other languages. So that's my, I would say, conscription. That's my immediate conscription. That's what I take as my most immediate conscription, but something which was not the work of my choice. Uh, and uh, Thank you. getting back, like getting back, you know, to the title of uh, this, um, to the title of our con uh, conversation and the title of my brief presentation, which which should be already ended. Yes, I'm taking too long. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I'm notorious with this Zabushko sentences as, as Ukrainian literature call them you know for two or three page pages long sentences with parentheses uh digressions and everything um so maybe i i should, I should stop yes. here yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe i should be interrupted forcefully interrupted speaking of violence forcefully interrupted here <laughs> Well, I think, uh, well, that's that's what I, these are the, the issues I, I wanted to discuss and uh, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you so much and sorry for interrupting you. Uh, we just uh, want to give, you know, there are so many people who want to ask you questions and talk to you. So I'm just going to briefly introduce your main interlocutor today. Uh, my colleague, our colleague, uh, <clears throat> Professor George Mihaychuk. Um, he's associate professor in the Department of Slavic Languages here at Georgetown. He teaches from first to third level Russian language courses and tutorial classes in Ukrainian. In addition to teaching languages, he offers a range of courses on Russian literature from general surveys such as 19th century Russian literature to upper level courses on Chekhov, Russian literally modernism and literature of the other Europe. His research interests include uh, um, late 19th century Russian literature, a discourse uh, or functional approach to narration, rhetoric, Ukrainian literature from the 1800s to 1930 and translation. He's working on a study of the pursuit of high culture in Ukrainian literature of the 19th century. And last February, he actually published a volume of translated plays of Vladimir Vinichenko titled Disharmony and Other Plays. Uh, so I, before I give the floor to George, let me remind the audience that you can uh, post your questions on the question answer using the question answer function. And uh, we will, try to, to give you know, uh, uh, the floor to as many of you as possible. We'll first have questions, uh, this discussion with, the, well, conversation with uh, Professor Mihaychuk, and then um, a few questions from the panelists, and then we'll open the floor to other questions. Thank you so much, and sorry <laughs> for interrupting you, Oksana. No, Just... no, no, <laughs> that was a, right, a very right thing to do. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anna, for uh, your introduction. Uh, Oksana, I want to thank you very much for being here. We are really very glad to have you participate. Um, one of the questions I'd like to start with is I'd like to bring up or raise an image or concept of the last of the Mohicans. You know, Fenimore Cooper's novel where mm -hmm. there's that sense, and as a child of immigrant parents, that the burden of continuing the culture rests upon you. And if you fail, it will disappear. And so I wanted to ask uh, how this played out in your life and your work, particularly in the Soviet period. And then of course, the sense of freedom after the post-Soviet period only to be faced again with this existential crisis. 
uh, you know, George, to be sincere, it still does. I mean, it did not end with uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. um, it is, uh, maybe it's due to the fact of my being a woman. And uh, we still, uh, okay, yeah, like as a woman, you still have to prove something. Mm -hmm. Uh, this has been the case in the 90s uh, when I was, uh, would say, the only one and only woman of my uh, of my generation of writers. There was also a, there was a literary critic, Solomia Pavlechko, who has done uh, a, a, an amazing job in introducing feminism, uh, you know, into Ukrainian, into post-Soviet Ukrainian culture and mentality. Mm, well, but basically, you know, it's I mean, it explains this uh, revolutionary role of the field field work in Ukrainian sex when it, when the novel was published in 1996. Uh, so, um, so you always have to prove uh, as a woman and both as a woman, um, as a writer, as a Ukrainian, as a Ukrainian writer, as a Ukrainian woman writer, you know, you have to prove that you are worthy. Uh, and that's something um, uh, by this by this you prove um, the uh, the worth the value of what you represent so this sense of this universal representation um, you know not by chance i've started you know with referring uh, with this reference to my uh, forgotten or unknown in the west literary mothers because every time it hurts, you know, when you think, when you appear on the international stage and as compared to your, I don't know, Russian or even Polish uh, counterparts, okay, you appear as an orphan. I was actually deeply hurt with this very complimentary uh, review um, of a reader of uh, the Museum of Abandoned Secrets when the novel appeared in English. Mm, with all these compliments uh, to the author and with this uh, uh, with a sentence like oh this is all the more amazing mm -hmm. that according to my knowledge it appeared from nowhere mm -hmm. and that was like a slap in the face you know because uh, I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it is incorrect even from the standpoint of literary theory because you know, big novels don't appear from nowhere. If there is a book, a, a, a thick novel, uh, you know, with the complex structure and it works and it is being, you know, rewarded, recognized, and so on and so forth, it means that, like with mushrooms, you know, there have been more and more. Uh, there were more mushrooms before. It is proof of some you know, school existing, uh, well, of some tradition it represents. But the fact, you know, that, uh, yes, it is like, you know, some this Cinderella that all of a sudden, you know, appeared on the international stage, you know, this uh, often, uh, you know, with no predecessors out of nowhere. And this is, this really hurts. So every time I, I appear uh, on the stage, be it abroad or, or in Ukraine. You know, I feel, uh, you know, I have to speak for all those silenced. And it is not only, you know, silence, not only my characters, or those, you know, the protagonists of my characters to whom I give, people to whom I give voice, but uh, I also give voice my predecessors uh, you know and uh, and i am a witness uh, i am a witness of their nobility so to speak uh, so uh, yes that you may call it this you know mohican complex uh, and uh, and it is, and it still works this way and uh, i would 
I would love to be finally liberated of it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. well, <laughs> yeah. but, but, you know, not under, I'm afraid not in my lifetime. I'd also like to continue sort of on, on the same theme. You know, Ukrainian literature has struggled for recognition. It's always been viewed as a province, provincial, uh, local color, perhaps. Uh, but my argument or my question is, it's not merely existence. It's not the fact that you wrote in Ukrainian that needs to be asserted, but it's really a struggle for status, for dignitas, yes. you know, um, yes. and, and to be recognized. And this is as a literature of merit, not just that, well, it's written in Ukrainian. And so I'm not surprised that in the West, a lot of times because they don't know that much about this or that, that you had the reaction from the reviewer. But how do you see Ukrainian literature achieving this process of recognition? <laughs> I'm sorry, the brief, the brief and only half joking answer would have been due to the help of the Ukrainian army. Oh, okay. Because with yeah. the successes of the Ukrainian army, all yeah. of a sudden, you know, it, the, it is, uh, as I said, it is a half joke. Because um, like we, all of a sudden, you know, um, we, we stopped having been overshadowed by Russia. Mm -hmm. And also, um, all of a sudden, you know, we turned in the eyes of the rest of the world into a successful society. Because successful army is a proof of the successful society behind it. Especially, you know, the army which is uh, relatively young and which, uh, you know, has been created some eight years ago due to the collective efforts, volunteers, uh, uh, crowdfunding and all these things that were happening, you know, uh, well, in the, uh, every, everyone could, could, could have followed in the news, you know, how it was happening. So it is the result of a strong and vibrant civil society of a very successful civil society which yes you may identify with the successful nation and this successful nation yes okay implies that there might be some interesting culture behind and then there is this you know cultural scene which is all covered in blood because uh, Part of the reason, well, actually, the main reason that most of these uh, writers like Lesia Ukrainka are still unknown in the West is uh, that, yes, they were, um, um, they were either silenced uh, or officially or in, within the uh, Soviet, uh, ofi official Soviet culture. Or uh, more than once, uh, well, they were, they have fallen uh, the victims of the purges um, and uh, until culturally uh, not quite rehabilitated until now because cultural rehabilitation takes longer than uh, the legislative one. And this process of cultural rehabilitation of our heritage, yes, it took us 30 years and, uh, and it is going to take, to take longer because, well, that's what you may call, uh, what Timothy Snyder, why Tim Snyder calls it a post-colonial war and uh, all these post-colonial complexes with discovering or rediscovering a nation, all this kind of stuff. Okay, let's, let's leave it, you know, uh, let's leave it somewhere behind the stage because, because because this is going to, to, to take us further than, than I would like to. And uh, then you'll have to interrupt me really, really, really by force because it, it is like the subject of the entire university, uh, university course, I'm afraid. Uh, well, so yeah, I'm sorry, this time I'm interrupting myself. <laughs> uh, to continue a little bit on that, I'm, 
I know that you're talking about visibility. In other words, Ukraine has become, let's say, visible in Western Europe yes. and in the West. Yes. But yes. the concern I have is the struggle with being acknowledged as a literature of merit. In other words, having the esteem, not simply of, oh, these are those singing and dancing people, but that actually this is a literature equal to, as you said with Lesio Kreinka, you know, that she can compare favorably with any of Western writers. So this is that kind of struggle maybe with tradition or adapting or copying, imitating whatever models in Western literature serve as, you know, this is the standard of what literature and culture should be. And how does Ukraine sort of try to find its own identity in its own literature and at the same time achieve a kind of esteem? And I'm sure that's an issue you must have faced uh, yourself. I mean, Milan Kundra went to Paris and wrote in French, right? Václav Havel stayed in Prague. So you, you have a difficult choice there. Uh, well, you know, what you've described, George, uh, can be, I think, defined as some kind of orientalistic stereotype applied to Ukraine. And yes, uh, it's colonial. It's very colonial image, and this colonial image comes is borrowed from Russian literature. So, um, so we we can't avoid this subject. I mean, if you really want to see proper Ukraine, if you really want to see proper Ukrainian tradition, you have, you know, to take off this Russian imperialistic glasses. And as a Russian scholar, uh, you know better than I do that Russian, uh, that imperialism in Russian culture, uh, has never been a mainstream subject in Russian studies in the West. Somehow it's uh, it's always been, I don't know, have silenced or, well, underestimated, so to speak. So um, uh, so that's, uh, that's another big issue, you know, one of the very big issues to be discussed. And that's what I, um, I don't know whether you've read, uh, I, uh, I've read, uh, whether you've read this, essay of mine that I published in Times Literary Supplement after Bucha, how to read Russian literature after Bucha. Yeah, many uh, Russian scholars were hurt uh, and offended and uh, complaining uh, that I attacked uh, Russian literature. While in fact, I what I was attacking uh, and uh, well, quite, purposefully, I would say, um, was, um, you know, this approach in uh, this approach in Russian studies, uh, this siding, uh, you know, with uh, siding with this taciturn imperialism of uh, Russia, um, of how Russia sees its non-Russian subject, mm -hmm. and it did include Russian intelligentsia, it did include big Russian writers, there were few exceptions, mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, very few exceptions, uh, well, but, um, uh, but this is something, you know, uh, this changing uh, the glasses, changing the optics, which I would, uh, I believe, uh, most topical issues, because in my um, deep conviction, um, it's one of the reasons um, that the West has been for um, all these 30 years staying blind to the rise of uh, the new totalitarianism in the northeast of Europe. The new Hitler mm -hmm. was missed totally and completely, you know, because this, uh, well, this glasses, you know, this, uh, this, the whole appeal of Russian culture was used I would say as a big mental distraction. 
-hmm. So somehow this spells should be deconstructed mm -hmm. now. Uh, so it is your time now. Mm -hmm. You're going to have, yeah, you <laughs> and your colleagues are going to have full hands of work. Thank you, Oksana. Thank you very much. I appreciate your answers. Thank you. Thank you so very much, George and Oksana. And this is Lourdes Ortega, one of the organizers. I would like to ask our students, um, uh, panelists to ask Oksana their questions. So let me first introduce uh, Jeremy. Jeremy Cohen is a first year master's uh, degree student in the Center for Eurasian, Russian and East European Studies. And he focuses on the intersection of national memory, identity and politics in Eurasia. And he has prepared one or two questions, maybe one question, Jeremy, and then we can ask Emily to ask her question. Yeah, definitely. Um, first, um, Yoku, um, Zabushko, it's uh, been great to have you here today. Um, so my question to you um, stems from when I was uh, reading through the Museum of Abandoned Secrets. So um, first, throughout its history, Ukraine has had um, exceptionally, uh, exceptional linguistic, ethnic, uh, and religious diversity. Um, but as a result of the tragedies of the 20th century, um, the country has homogenized considerably. So that history has featured prominently in your own work, um, like I said, particularly in the Museum of Abandoned Secrets. So what role do you think that Ukrainian writers can play in keeping that diverse, uh, that legacy of diversity um, and what remains of it today, uh, today um, alive and relevant in Ukrainian society? Uh, well, you know, well, thank you very much. It's an interesting question, but um, you know, as I guess I've said, you know, in our brief exchange before we have started this webinar, uh, war unfortunately is uh, the mighty interruption in any you know normal continuity of events uh, that could be predicted uh, well along some, you know, scholarly uh, ruminations. Um, so right now, I would say uh, it, is, it is an interruption and it is uh, also, uh, I would say, um, outburst, you know, of, of energy, uh, like, you know, I said about this, you know, my personal conscription, you know, something uh, that, yes, the nation under stress, the writers under stress, the new writers appearing on the stage, uh, um, new genres coming into action. Uh, and of course, yes, people sharing their experience. Uh, don't forget it is, you know, what is extremely interesting uh, from the artistic point of view. Mm, I hate, you know, to sound that scholarly because it's, uh, it's, you know, a, it's a very living, burning matter. It's people's, you know, life and death, and it's very existential. It is all happening, you know, now and, uh, you know, in the same time and maybe in the same minute that we are talking. But yes, it is the first war, um, maybe in the history of, of, of civilization, yes, the first war in the history of civilization, which can be followed online. If you wish, you really can spend, you know, well, 24 hours all around the clock, watching uh, social media, watching uh, these uh, short films posted by soldiers, by volunteers, well, something, uh, well, all this, you know, public journalism and everything. And it's extremely emotional thing, extremely emotional. That's something which does change, uh, and it already has changed, I would say, uh, our understanding of the previous war. Uh, the like theoretically, we knew that the worst thing were never told because those who experienced the worst did not survive to tell about them. Uh, so uh, all the memoirs that we have from the previous wars, uh, well, uh, they are the memoirs of the survivors. So already, you know, the winners 
the memoirs by the winners, uh, a chance to tell the story, to tell your story is already a privilege. Mm, and um, and it really like you know changes accents a little bit. So uh, to put it briefly, uh, well, as brief as I can, um, I really can't say how Ukrainian literature will get out of this grand challenge of this big you know trial of history in a couple of years. You know, I'm seeing your, uh, I'm seeing people of your age, like uh, posting uh, on social media extremely interesting brief essays from the trenches, poems and brief essays. You know, this most mobile genres, and uh, well, maybe something totally new will come out of this. Uh, but it's going to be a new kind of diversity, you know, not the one we are used to, not the one we are familiar with, uh, and, uh, well, I don't know, the new, the new world, really, the new world, the new society, the new country, and the new Europe in the end, because it does affect, um, well, you are too far away, I would say, from uh, the center of the event, but this war has already triggered, uh, you know, lots of collective traumas in the neighboring countries. Uh, like to give you a very brief example, a couple of weeks ago, I've been uh, on the panel in Barcelona with Sophie Oxanen, uh, the Finnish uh, writer, you may know, uh, you may have read her Purge, uh, the novel which had been translated into like 40 something languages. And well, she is actually uh, well, uh, very uh, well uh, critically acclaimed, uh, you know, award winning writers, one of the, uh, you know, most known of her generation of European writers. And she, uh, she told an amazing story. Uh, that um, on February 24, um, uh, there was um, this a big, um, you know, turmoil, real turmoil uh, in uh, the this homes for the elderly all over Finland, because all these uh, old people who were remembering the winter war of 1940 were perfectly sure that the Russians came back and they are attacking Finland. Uh, and they were calling uh, in panic, uh, they were calling their grandchildren and grand grandchildren, uh, you know, explaining how to behave themselves, how to say water and, you know, all these uh, things necessary to survive. And uh, that's amazing how, you know, for the entire nation, uh, this. Uh, well, uh, 80 years old trauma all of a sudden surfaced, uh, which means uh, to what extent it has been seen under articulated, suppressed. So how many abandoned secrets we are having, not only in Ukraine, you know, uh, it's kind of a universal, at least European phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I think versatility, eh, and then, you know, coming of this new versatile world, which uh, is showing up on uh, what used to be seen as homogeneous Russia. And where now you see the protests of women in Yakutsk, the protest of Yakutian women singing their traditional folk uh, anti-military dance and women in Dagestan, again, you know, protesting against the war in their traditional way. Uh, um, well, so, uh, I mean, th this is amazing, you know, how from under this, uh, you know, totalitarian fake of, 
Ruski mir of this Russian world as you know constructed by Putin and his uh, ideology uh, ideologists of spin doctors how you know this uh, this world of cultural versatility uh, still alive and struggling for life shows up so I think uh, uh, that's, a, that's basically what we are fighting for. That's the point of this war, to have this versatile war as opposed to this Orwellian-like monotony. Mm. Thank you so much, Oksana and Jeremy. And it was a very good question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, Thank very you. good question. Um, Emily is also going to ask you a question. Emily Green is a senior in the School of Foreign Service, and she majors in international politics, concentrating in law and minoring in Russian. She takes particular interest in the legal frameworks and institutions of human rights law, especially in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Emily? Thank you so much, um, and thank you so much again. Uh, Dr. Zabushko for being here. It is a huge honor um, for all of us here to get the chance to speak with you today. Um, so my okay. question is, I know a common theme in your work is the West's inability to understand the situation in Ukraine. Um, and in your recent piece, No Guilty People in the World Reading Russian Literature After the Bucha mm -hmm. Massacre, um, mm -hmm. you criticize the Western realist perspective of thinkers like John Mearsheimer, and in your work, an album for Gustav, we're introduced to the bewildered German photographer Gustav, who appears to symbolize mm -hmm. the West's inability to truly understand Ukraine. Um, as a student of international politics, I'm curious to know your perspective on how Western policymakers can make better choices regarding Ukraine and how Western academics can really see and understand the situation, unlike our character Gustav. Oh. Well... Thank you. Um, thank you. It's, uh, you know, it's another question which would go for, <laughs> I don't know, for an hour um, to be somehow covered. Uh, but um, I think, I think we should start with changing the university curricula with changing the lists of recommended literature, with, with changing focuses. Um, you know, I really appreciate what uh, Timothy Snyder is doing and what he has been trying to do, you know, in uh, the Western academia for many years and, uh, you know, now publishing his lectures uh, popular lectures and uh, it is like uh, you know like prophecing like sharing good news I, I can understand you know this impetus of an academic you know who who uh, who sees this you know practical need in his immediate practical need in his knowledge which which might uh, I don't know, save people's lives yeah um and uh, and yes, it is it is the matter again, you know, of uh, fighting uh, of fighting the stereotypes and fighting. Uh, uh, well, um, I maybe maybe you know I used by way to make myself brief, uh, you know, before we'll be kicked out of the stage. Um, well, I uh, might use uh, an example. Uh, like, uh, you know, I've been presenting uh, this book uh, on Frankfurt Book Fair um, in uh, October. Uh, presenting means like you are scheduled, you know, for some 12 interviews in uh, uh, two days. Uh, and like uh, like you are, you know, conversing, you know, with the Western journalists. So, um, so it was after uh, the after three, two or three of them asked me about um, um, like 
what I think as a you know feminist and as a woman no, known uh, as a writer known to be a woman's voice you know for so many years what I think about this archaic macho um, uh, you know frame uh, in which we see this war and and I'm like excuse me uh, what are we talking about well you know we see the men you know all these men in militaries and uh, you know with the guns and it is uh, it is again you know the same story men going to the front and women you know saving the women running away fleeing or fleeing the country fleeing from under the bombs you know to save their children and everything and uh, and you know, I was um, I was just speechless for a moment, and I said, "Hey, um, do you know how many women uh, serve in the Ukrainian army? What is the percent of women at service in Ukrainian army?" No, they didn't. Uh, I wonder whether whether you know thirty percent. 30% of Ukrainian army are women. And right on the same day that uh, we were discussing this alleged, you know, archaic, macho, well, unwomanly, wars unwomanly face, so to speak, to use Svetlana Alexievich's formula. I mean, bright formula, yes, but for the 20th century, not for this war. Uh, right at these same days, uh, there was the big news in Ukraine. Uh, 108 women were released from the Russian captivity where they had spent uh, three months. And goodness, I mean, this very picture uh, just, uh, just, well, Google, you know, 100 eight women's, uh, by, by 108 uh, Ukrainian military women uh, released uh, on October 17 uh, from Russian captivity. And just, just look at this picture, how these girls are crossing the border. The, their faces, their, their entire look, how they are marching. Uh, this picture should be, should have been on the first pages of all the world newspapers, because this is the womanly face of war. And yes, war does have a womanly face as well. Yes, the Greeks did know something about it when they were having, uh, along with the god of war, the, they were having the goddess of war, who was Athens, who was a goddess of wisdom at the same time. So while, you know, this uh, male face of war is more on the side of the, you know, physical domination, um, well, women are more about, I don't know, yes, wisdom, tactics, strategy, okay, being like physically, physically weaker okay then they they can um, they can uh, you know play here on the other field but you know since war is part of human activity yes it does have both faces main, uh, male and female and and nowhere else uh, it, it, can it be more visible than uh, nowadays in Ukraine in this war? And yes, we are proud of our girls. Uh, but then it appeared that just to make this fact accepted, taken, uh, like um, translated, you know, into the language of contemporary media, this media should change some stereotypes because even if there are you know this ready-made pictures of this brave and victorious 
military women, you know, crossing, crossing the border and showing they know the country. That's very, that's very womanly. You know, they know the country is now looking at the, the nation is looking at her girls. So, so they have to look perfect, you know, unlike men, men don't care when they come from the, when they return from the captivity, they don't care much about how they look. And here still, you know, they have to prove, you know, that, that yes, we can be proud of them. So, so it, it's extremely interesting. Lot, I mean, so much material to discuss, so much things to be discussed. Mm, and, and, you know, and I, and I have to explain all this, like something that is being missed right now, because it is not seen, it is not included, you know, into what people expect to see. So the very portrayal of this war is already, well, kind of, uh, I don't know, de deformated, uh, being deformated in the process of deformation. So I think this might serve, um, you, you know, you see what I'm driving at here. So this might be seen as a, as a good example, uh, well, what should be done. Uh, you know, again, like, uh, I, I can't give, you know, the, the direct recommendations, but uh, to summarize, yes, it's, it's about fighting stereotypes. It's about changing curricula, broadening <laughs> horizons. Thank you very, very much, Emily and Oksana. And uh, we only have 10 minutes left. But I would like to introduce Negar Siyari, who is a doctoral student in linguistics. And she's originally from Iran. And in her doctoral wow. research, she works with uh, refugees and newcomers from Afghanistan. And so mm -hmm. everything that we have been discussing is also very close to her heart, to yeah. her research mm -hmm. interests, but in a geography completely different or very different uh, from, from Europe and from Ukraine. So Nagar, would you like to ask any question from Oksana and also some of the questions from the audience in just a minute? <laughs> yes, I'll try my best. Hi, Dr. Zabushko. Thank you so much for a great conversation so far. It's been very um, um, uh, informative for me so far. Uh, my question real quickly is about uh, the, uh, it's actually, um, from the um, Reinventing the Poet essay that I read from you. Uh, so in that uh, essay, you quote T.S. Eliot, uh, where he says, I'm, I'm going to quote him, but unless you teach that people to feel in a new language, mm -hmm. you have not eradicated the old one, the old mm -hmm. language, and it will reappear in poetry, which is the vehicle of feeling. Um, mm -hmm. For a newbie audience uh, to your Ukrainian literature, uh, could you please tell a little bit more about how Ukrainian poetry has been a vehicle of feelings and how it's been uh, turned into a unifying power probably um, at this point? Um. Well, maybe maybe not less now, uh, but no. I mean, emotionally, you know, in this uh, in this periods of this, you know, existential challenges for for the entire society. Yes, poetry again becomes important. Uh, just appears people people write well. I mean, tremendous amount of poems nowadays. I mean, I'm not saying that all of them are masterpieces, you know, but um, but if you uh, if you follow, uh, if you go on to open your computer in the in the morning and go into Ukrainian Facebook or, or Twitter or even Twitter, you know, well, everyone writes, everyone posts uh, something, uh, well, some, Poetry as a most efficient, um, you know, uh, most succinct uh, and economic, so to speak, efficient language, uh, also the most democratic one, because it can be written everywhere. Uh, well, novel is something that calls for uh, the well-developed, a society with established institutions which can afford paying people for uh, well for free time people having free time you know to get focused on 
creating uh, on building a novel like like the house is built uh, <laughs> while poetry yeah poetry appears like uh, from the air, it can be written in a prison cell, it can be written uh, in the uh, war trenches, it can be written uh, like uh, on walking and uh, and it is uh, with, with this regard, yes, it is irreplaceable because it is this, um, you know, most, I mean, also the, the oldest genre of all, you know, like, yeah, love um uh, funeral lamentation and love incantation you know the original the most primordial genres of literature and yes they are both poetry so it is about uh, yes love and death and that's where people that's where people feel um where a human being feels that um, she needs another language mm -hmm. that the one which is used on the everyday level and in which you know we ask uh, we ask a neighbor to pass the salt uh, at the table yeah so um, so it is uh, in a way yes it is uh, you know this kind of a um, the, very close to the sacred languages of the of many religions, so mm -hmm. to speak. So it is our secular, you know, language uh, of uh, of this of this utmost uh, of this most existential human experience. And with this regard, uh, with this regard, yes, uh, there are times. There are times which are good for poetry. There are times uh, which are not. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, for Ukrainians, for for Ukrainian literature, for Ukrainian culture, uh, poetry has always been uh, traditionally important, which is a proof that we were not having that much good times in our <laughs> history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to um, ask uh, a few questions from the audience. Um, uh, one question is, good day, Oksana. I am Irina from Kiev, now English language learner. With friends, we are reading now your book, Your Ad Could Go Here. Uh -huh. My question about one story, girls. Oksana, what was the main message you wanted to send to readers? <laughs> Uh, well, that's something. Uh, we, uh, that's the question which, the question that always embarrasses me. Uh, like because I think it's um, it's somebody else's job. It's a job of literary scholars to translate uh, writers' work uh, into main language, uh, into main messages, and uh, well, the other messages, and and so on and so forth. Uh, well, uh, we just, you know, write as I said, as I said before, you know, we write about life as it is, and uh, and it's a message in itself. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, which of us can be seen by someone else as a message. So uh, every character is a message by herself. And, uh, and yes, it's about love. Yes, it's about learning how to love. It's about the first experience of love and betrayal that comes very early uh in uh, life uh, yes it is a pre-puberty i think that that the characters are entering in this drama that affects uh, both they are both both uh, their lives uh, upwards for decades uh, to come mm, so there are many messages i mean it can be read on different levels and uh, that's something again you know that's another advantage of literature as compared to uh, 
I would say, well, scholarly monograph or something. Mm, but it is always kind of multi facetious. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always ambiguous. It, it's all, it has different, you know, levels of meanings on which it can be read, and uh, and that's why it um, it can be read in uh, years, maybe in decades. Uh, well, this this angles being changed. Uh, um, well, like like an onion, you know level after level taken off so the rest is up to a reader every book every piece has as many messages i think as it has the readers sounds great um in the next one or two minutes i'm gonna ask another question uh from diana thank you for your insightful speech uh, this is Diana, a Ukrainian student at Georgetown, uh, SCS, a Doctor of Liberal Studies program. I am going to write my research work about developing Ukrainian identity after the independence. I know you write a lot about identity and post-colonial Ukraine. Could you please tell me what book of yours you highly recommend to read that would be the most useful for my future research work, shaping Ukrainians' identity after the independence? Ah, well, I would say essays, uh, and I have um, I have an essay, uh, I have a collection of essays entitled uh, The Chronicles of Fortin Brass, which I published, uh, I think, in 2000. Uh, so, um, and that's, uh, that, that's kind of something that epitomizes uh, how I saw then uh, the mission, so to speak, or the task, uh, to speak less bombastically, uh, of uh, my generation of writers and intellectuals. Uh, uh, Fortin Brass being, let me remind you, uh, in case you have forgotten, uh, the, this character that appears in the end of Hamlet, uh, and gives uh, the order uh, when when the stage is full of dead corpses, like everyone is already killed. Horatio is the only survivor, and enter Fortin Brass, and Fort it's Fortin Brass who gives an order clean the stage of the dead corpses and to record the story from Horatio, the survivor of the, and witness. Uh, so I think it's very, um, it's a very important character in uh, Shakespeare, unfortunately underestimated. Uh, and uh, this, this I was seeing as mission of uh, my generation of intellectuals to clean after the 20th century and to record the story and i have to to be able like to move further uh, i have to say uh, that unfortunately my generation of europeans screwed this mission up because if we did not this one of the days wouldn't have been possible this war is precisely the continuation of all the missed and unlearned lessons of the 20th century. So I strongly recommend Chronicle uh, of Fortin Brass, the Chronicles of Fortin Brass, the essays of the 90s. They, they already have, you know, all this, you know, intellectuals, intellectual plots and turns. Uh, that that have later been developed in my later works. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Zabushko, uh, our panelists, and uh, everyone who attended today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we run out of time. So I uh, please, um, as you can see in the chat, you can uh, go to our website and also use the uh, Padlet link for discussion board in which you can ask additional questions from Dr. Zabushko uh, in there. 
Um, and uh, for your information, uh, our seminar series will continue in spring 2023. Uh, we will uh, keep you updated on our website regarding uh, the specific details of our next events. Uh, for now, again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thank you so much, Dr. Zabushko, for uh, a great, insightful conversation. It's my pleasure. That touched thank our you. hearts uh, despite everything that's going on. And we wish you all the best. Thank, thank, you, thank you, so you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you so very much.